Welcome to Madang. Today's very special guest is the Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney. She shares about her sabbatical grant from the Louisville Institute, how she uses Twitter in the classroom. She also discusses Advent, Jesus, and Hagar, and how she doesn't use such words as kingdom, but rather majesty, and doesn't use racialized binary and uses gender expansive language. So much discussion on her new lectionary. Please stay tuned. Do you try to be a Christian but find church really difficult? Do you try to live faithfully but wrestle with embracing risk? Do you find yourself thinking a lot about who you are becoming? If so, then you need to read some Kierkegaard with us. When we risk getting lost, maybe we can then find faith. To learn more and join over 1,000 others in the group, head to iheartkierkegaard.com. The Buddhist Zhu Chi Foundation is a volunteer-based global organization with missions in charity, medicine, education, and humanist culture. The foundation provides community and social services, national and international disaster relief, medical and charitable assistance, education, environmental protection, and a bone marrow donor registry promoting humanistic values and community volunteerism. Su Chi is currently sending emergency aid to eight Asian countries, India, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, Cambodia, Sri Lanka, Laos, and Taiwan, providing communities with life-saving medical equipment and supplies to help them overcome the COVID-19 pandemic. To find out more and to donate, please visit our website at www.suchi.us slash coronavirus. Invisible, published by Fortress Press, is available for pre-order wherever books are sold. Show your support and pre-order your copy today. For sponsorship inquiries, please email madangpodcast.gmail.com. This is Madang, an outdoor living room for guests to share their experiences and their work. I invite you to come in stay for a while. Welcome to Madang Podcast. My name is Grace Jisun Kim. I'm the host. And this Madang Podcast is also hosted by Christian Century Magazine. Today, I have a really special guest, um, the Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney. She is the Wright Reverend Sam B. Husley Professor of Hebrew Bible at Bright Divinity School in Fort Worth, Texas. She is the author of Womanist Midrash, a reintroduction to women of the Torah and of the throne, a commentary on Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah in the Wisdom series, Daughters of Miriam, and co-editor of the People's Bible and the People's Companion to the Bible. She is an Episcopal priest, canonically resident in the Diocese of Pennsylvania, and licensed in the Diocese of North Texas, and a form, former Army chaplain and congregational pastor in the AME Zion Church. She is the author of, a, of Women's Lectionary for the Whole Church and translator of its biblical selections, and the first two volumes, Year A and W, which are standalone volumes, are now published. And we are here today to discuss these two volumes. So welcome, Dr. Will Gaffney. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Wonderful to see you again. Yes, so nice to see you. And there's been such great buzz on these lectionaries. Um, the praise of Reverend um, Tracy Blackman says, a woman's lectionary for the whole church challenges the androcentric landscape of our most common readings, upending customary theological constructs to uncover the presence of the feminine divine. So, and the, the accolades go on and on and on. So it's such a thrill to have you today to discuss these two fantastic volumes, which are so important for the church. But before we get to that, I wanted to congratulate you on the sabbatical grant, the Louisville sabbatical grant, which allowed you time to write these. So congratulations to you. Thank you. And I also know that uh, you got your undergrad from Earlham College. 
That's which true. Is, that is I true. know, which is so exciting because I teach at Earlham School of Religion. Oh. And yes, we are part of Earlham College. Yeah. So yeah, I had informed um, the marketing team that you will be my next guest. And we are just thrilled because you, uh, you were one of the very few Black students in your class. So how was that experience um, doing your undergrad at Earlham College? Um, one year, there were seven of us. I want to say it ranged between maybe 11 at its peak, but uh -huh. yeah, some years for very few Black students. Uh, we were fairly closely well knit. Uh -huh. uh, it was a it was a good college experience. Oh, that's wonderful. It's in a very tiny little town. So I'm so glad um, that we have that connection. And our mutual friend, uh, Dr. James Logan is um, there as a associate dean or something very high up somewhere. <laughs> so we're just both thrilled um, that you are my next guest on this Madang podcast. Um, and also, before we get into the book, into the two volumes, I wanted to uh, ask you, how do you use social media in the classroom? Because you and I both were in um, the Wabash um, workshop on social media. Mm. So, and I remember you were telling me how you use Twitter in your classroom. And for someone like me, so afraid of using uh, social media in the classroom, let alone just kind of day to day, Tell us how you use it and how you have such huge following. So how do you do it and what makes it keep going in your classrooms? It really does vary by the students. And so I've watched it as I've taught the same class in different semesters and different years. But the primary way in which I was using Twitter in the classroom was uh, to engage conversation with the wider public about the subject of the class. And this was my introduction to interpreting the Hebrew Bible in context course. And so students had the option of participating in the closed discussion forum on our LMS, our learning management system, which is Brightspace D2L, or uh, conversing in the classroom setting, but the numbers were so large that everyone couldn't do that. And then Twitter was another option. So, the aim was to make sure all the students had an opportunity to participate and to be in dialogue with others, uh, but to make sure that they had options. So those who did not wanna be in the Twitter streets certainly didn't have to, and those who could not uh, find space to talk in class had uh, also other options. So that was the primary use and it worked quite well. I would also lead into the course by posting something uh, from the class or the books or something to generate some conversation. And so that first year, it went very well. The next year, there was a dip in, in uh, participation. And then the following year, it came back. So I've watched it go up and down. So that's the, the primary way. Uh, informally, because students know that I use Twitter, uh, there are students who will hop on just to chat about a class, even if that's not uh, a rubric that they can fulfill uh, an assignment with. So those are the primary ways that I use uh, Twitter. In terms of social media writ large, some of my assignments uh, can be fulfilled creatively. So students might do a blog or vlog series, um, or some students have, who have podcasts have done podcast episodes to fulfill assignments. So I uh, have a set of wide open assignments where they can bring their creativity, and many of them are choosing to use social media. Wow, that's so exciting. So you're just giving me all these ideas of what I should do and what I can do. I'm just a little, a uh, few years behind you. So maybe one year I may try, but I just find it so fascinating that you're so creative and how you are able to teach using social media and blogs and podcasts. So that's great. I, I'm just learning so much from you. So as we get into this volume, so these two are out and I love your background for the Zoom. Year one, year A and year W. I, you know, reading through this, it is like paradigm shifting for me. Mm -hmm. It is so important. And 
can you just tell us how you came about doing this? Because I can't imagine doing one. You're going to do four. And so you did two. How did you start this process? And many of our listeners, they may have never written a book, let alone a comment, like this whole uh, commentary for the church year. So tell us how you began this process. It began with my own preaching. And I was on uh, social media and I'm going to look it up because someone found it for me recently. I, I was on Facebook and then later I posted on Twitter that I was writing a sermon and I was very unsatisfied with the sermon text. Uh -huh. and, uh, and I asked this question, what would it look like if women built a lectionary focusing on women's stories. Um, and that, that uh, tweet along with, uh, here it is. Um, oh, you found so it. I, I, I said that I just didn't uh, like the, the lectionary choices. Uh -huh. yeah. And I went to, uh, complain about it on uh, social media and I said we need a women's lectionary and several of my friends followers and fans and said yeah we do you do it and I said well you, know, <laughs> you that, do it <laughs> that's not the plan so uh, on October 16th 2017 I, I wrote clearly I'm going way off lectionary for this next sermon I'm tired of seeing the same old thin slices of text again and again. And then a little bit later uh, that day, I said, what would it look like if women built a lectionary focusing on women's stories? So that was 2017. I applied, began applying for that Louisville grant because they have to be in by November. Yeah. Uh, and then I received it the following year in 2018. And then that wasn't time for me to go on sabbatical 2019. Uh, which is where I did the bulk of the writing for the first year. And then while we were in isolation during 2020, finished the second. So I started by saying I wanted something else to preach from. I've never felt limited to the lectionary, but I'm in a lot of lectionary based settings since I'm an Episcopal priest. And so I decided that uh, I wanted to see what it would look like if the lessons for each week and congregations that use shared text generally pull from four, a First Testament lesson, a psalm or canticle, a piece of poetry, a, an epistle, and then the gospel. What would it look like to have for each of the 52 Sundays of the year and the principal feast of the Episcopal Church and every day in Holy Week and every day in Easter week because we have daily services, if we had uh, lessons that told the stories of the scriptures through women? Well, there wouldn't necessarily be enough. So then let's start looking at texts where women are present, or let's look at texts where women are invisible in the people of Israel. So the people of Israel are moving here and they're doing this. How does that affect the women and children that are buried in the people of Israel or the children of Israel? So I uh, made this proposal, which was uh, received well and I got the grant. And so I started thinking about what stories would go together. Uh, I began trying to drive the lectionary from the Hebrew Bible because that's my expertise. But I really had to start with the season of the year. Okay, Advent. Advent is about preparing for the return of Christ in part by remembering his Advent the first time he came. So what stories are gonna tie into that theme then pull those out of the Hebrew Bible, then find a Psalm that may partner with that imaginatively, then a gospel. And I always found the epistle last because I find the epistles the least useful and the least gender friendly, woman friendly. So for example, in year W, which is the only standalone version, year A is the first of the three year cycle. Mm -hmm. In year W, I decided that the Advent the four Sundays of Advent would all focus on annunciations. And there are four annunciations in the Hebrew Bible. Hagar's annunciation, Sarah's annunciations, Hannah's annunciation, and the annunciation that's given to the mother of Samson. So 
Uh, obviously, it's thematically Advent, those annunciations in conversation with the Blessed Virgin Mary's annunciation and so forth. So that's how I built it. And I knew that I wanted to do a particular type of translation. I I'm never satisfied with published translations. And so I did a uh, gender expansive translation, which means I took those expressions like people and Israelites and Canaanites and expanded them to the women, men and children of Israel and Canaan. Um, and then I took the genealogical information and instead of uh, being, oh, I don't know, uh, the, the son of, of Jacob, uh, I would have said um, of Rebecca's lineage, right? And so then I would set that off in brackets or let the reader know in the text comments where I've done that. So they would always know when I was expanding the text in terms of its gender. And I wanted to do one more thing for people who don't hear or pray with feminine God language. Um, I used a variety of God language, most of it uh, neutral imagery, like uh, the fire of Sinai, the ark of safety, but some of it gendered, and then it would be feminine gendered language. But in the Psalms, whenever there is a pronoun, I did invert the gender so that the, so God is explicitly feminine uh, through pronouns whenever a pronoun occurs in the Psalms. So people would have that experience of praying out loud and hearing feminine God language. Because what I found is that when people use neuter language or inclusive language, they're not shifting their paradigms to use your language, right? So somebody who thinks God is an old white man with a beard on a throne is going to hear father in their head, whether you say creator or redeemer or sovereign or provider. Uh, but when you say mother, they have to readjust. And for some that will not be welcome. And so I also give the recommendation that if these translations will not be received well in your congregation, then use the readings from uh, the Bible of your choice. There's many ways to use the lectionary. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing all that. It is uh, paradigm shifting. And I think when you're using the expansive language and that's a new term for me. So I, I thank you for that. It, it is, it's so beneficial because we realize, and you said a, a few minutes earlier, how some people are invisible. So we know that women have been made invisible in scripture. I think you said somewhere um, there is like 1,426 names and 11 names or 9% of the names are women. So women have been marginalized, have been made invisible. And just coincidentally, my new book that's coming out is called Invisible too, because Asian American women are made invisible. So when you use this expansive gender language, it is so helpful because you are kind of making a statement that women and children were there too. So I'm so grateful for that. And um, the thought of using the mother language and the feminine language, I know you bring in spirit and how, um, you see, for a Presbyterian, I was supposed to take Greek and Hebrew and then two modern language for some reason. And I was trying to figure out before this podcast why I was exempt from taking Hebrew, but I was, and I might be the only Presbyterian who was exempt, but I'm really grateful because I don't think I would have passed the Hebrew language. For you, uh, you know, this language comes to you so beautifully and you are able to translate and read into, I am just so grateful for your translation and for your work. And you talk about how spirit is feminine uh, in the Hebrew. So can you um, expand on that? Because for me, that is so helpful as a theologian. And I think it'd be helpful for many listeners and those who are going to be reading your um, lectionary and using them. And I'm in, and it, you, you, you kind of wrote it for those who are preachers and also for devotional. And I think that, because for me, I don't preach every Sunday. Before the pandemic, I used to preach almost every Sunday, but now that I don't, 
it is really devotional. And I think mm -hmm. even non-Christians will learn so much from this. So can you just say a bit more about the spirit language and the translation and mm -hmm. how you did it? What were the steps? Like, did you get up in the morning and start doing this? Because I can't imagine how you still put this thing together. It's, it's an amazing two volumes that I have here. Well, the with the spirit language, I would direct your listeners to Womanist Midrash, and I go into detail on that phenomenon there. Very simply, uh, biblical languages are gendered. Hebrew is a binary language with only uh, feminine and masculine uh, grammatical categories. Greek has a neuter category. And that means that everything has a grammatical gender, which uh, if, they're, if you're talking about a biological uh, entity uh, like a person or a cow, then grammatical gender will align with their bi biological gender. You have feminine words for cows and masculine words for bulls, etc. cetera. Uh, and, but then there's a category of things uh, for which uh, we don't gender in English. And this happens with Spanish and French, you know, where uh, la mesa and la table are both uh, feminine in French and Spanish for table. Uh, so then the question becomes, what is the significance of gendered language with God? Uh, to put it in a flat and um, in neutral uh, way, uh, the, the scriptures, uh, both Hebrew and Greek, use a variety of language for God and a variety of imagery for God. And some of the language that is used for God is grammatically feminine. Most is masculine, and people know those terms, uh, Father, Lord, etc. although uh, Lord is a special case. Uh, so... In Genesis 1-1, the very first verb, Bereshit bara, uh, when beginning God created, that is a masculine singular verb, he created God, a masculine singular noun is the subject. But in the next uh, verse, Veruach Elohim Rachefet Al Mayim, in the next verse, it's, and the spirit of God, she was fluttering or hovering over the face of the waters. So Genesis uses both genders with God, which makes sense in terms of the narrative they're crafting, because when God says, let us make humanity in our image, uh, the humanity that is created uh, is in each of those binary genders that God has inhabited in one way or another at the beginning of the story. Now, the reason that English readers, and this is true I'm, for, for some other languages into which the scripture is translated, you'll have to tell me about Korean, is that when the spirit occurs and does something and takes a verb, English translators have, by what I call a conspiracy, only translated by repeating the noun. So they will say, instead of saying the, uh, where the text might say, uh, the spirit, she came upon Saul, they'll just say the spirit came upon Saul. So they will, they will always translate, the spirit does, the spirit moves, the spirit is rather than um, she did, she moved, she clothed Gideon so that the reader will have never seen the feminine pronoun. So they won't use the wrong pronoun and make it masculine. They will just trust that people have been conditioned to read masculine into God. So when they see spirit, the spirit, the spirit, the Holy Spirit later, um, they will just interpret that as masculine. Uh, and so that's unfortunate. So how do we fix that? Even, so you asked me about Korean. I haven't read a Korean Bible in my adult life, but as a kid, I used to. My mother made me read the Korean Bible. And I the word for God is Hananim, which is kind of gender neutral, but Koreans add father to it. So it goes right. Hananim Aboji. Aboji is father. And it just automatically then becomes masculine so we as you say there is this feminine and how it is a gendered language how do we fix this we've had this 2000 years of male european uh heterosexual theologians and then these biblical scholars who have given us all this masculine language even the lectionaries have been so male-centered like i feel like until you came along like we've just been doing it wrong. So I'm so indebted to you. How do we though go about and fixing this huge problem that we face in our seminary, in our seminary classrooms, 
in our churches and just um, in our faith communities. It's a broader problem because what will happen is when you talk to people about this linguistic phenomenon, they'll say, uh, yes, this language occurs, but, but God is male. And then you ask, why is God male? And you'll get a couple of answers. One will be because of all of this masculine language. Well, uh, if that's the case, then should you not say that God is this much masculine and this much feminine because that's how it breaks down? Or they'll say God is male because God is the father of Jesus. And when you press them on the point biologically, um, uh, Jesus was not conceived like any other person. And they're certainly not making an argument, uh, God formed a penis and, or deposited sperm, right? So the whole conception is miraculous because in part, it doesn't follow the rules of human re reproduction. Now, culturally, it makes sense for God to be Jesus' father, given how androcentric and patriarchal was the context in which he was born. But is that determinative? And does God even have a gender? Uh, Rabbi Daniel Rickberg says the pronoun for God is God. So part of it is, we, is this language question arises in a structure in which uh, the masculinity of God has been affirmed and defended and uh, decided as immutable uh, and connected to things like male hegemony and male headship. Um, so simply pointing this out is not going to unravel the whole thing, but it, it frays at the, it, at the edges. And so part of what I want to accomplish is for people to know that even though the Bible is androcentric, even though parts of it are patriarchal, parts of it are paternalistic and parts of it are misogynist, there are still in there these 111 named women whom most people do not know, scores more unnamed women. And it's possible to frame preaching texts for all of the Christian seasons around passages that include women and tell some of the same stories, but also tell some different stories. And then we have to reckon with how women are treated. Uh, so if the gospel isn't good news to the women in the passage, is it still good news? If it's not good news to those who are enslaved in the passage, is it still good news? If it's not good news to the Canaanites who are occupied and have a foreign people come in and say, this is our land because our God said so, um, you know, how do we read that in solidarity with Native Americans? How do we read that with uh, the Native Africans of South Africa? So this project is going to push at those questions as does all good theology. Uh, but so how do we change it? I think we begin to change by how we hear scripture, how we read scripture, how we teach scripture, and, and how we preach scripture. So that was why I told the Louisville Institute that I saw this project as a biblical literacy project, that this is getting people to know more of what's in their Bibles and ask questions about what they think they know. Yeah, you sure do. And, um, you know, lectionaries, you know, when we look at the world population, 31% of the world are, are Christians, and 60% of Christians engage in lectionary. So what you have done is going to impact so much of how we think about God, how we read scripture, and how we have misread scripture, or all this mistranslation. So I think your work is so impactful, and I really hope it gets translated into Korean and other languages ASAP. Because well, that you know that raises the question. So for uh -huh. languages that don't have gendered forms, mm -hmm. uh, so it may not be a direct translation yeah. uh, into mm -hmm. some languages, right? Uh, because there's things I can play with. Um, so if I'm using uh, like Wisdom of the Ages as a title for God. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the wisdom of the ages is faithful. Well, in English, that verb isn't gendered. But if I were to do that in Spanish, even though wisdom of the ages is not a particularly gendered term, I would have to choose one gender or the other. And so part of this project was also using uh, gender neutral language and non-binary language for divinity as well as for humanity. So well, using a variety that, yeah. of languages. And mm -hmm. to go back to your story about 
father, the gendered father being added to the non-gendered God in Korean, this is the, this is the work of the white mis missionary imagination or lack of imagination. Because in uh, a variety of African languages where God is not gendered, uh, it was important for them to impose a gender either by adding a term or choosing a different term for God, sometimes a minoritized term for God that didn't, rec uh, that didn't refer to the being that many people understood as the creator of the universe because they were trying to saddle a particular masculine construct um, and so to make sure they were worshiping the right God, the right way, that meant with this gender baggage um, so that they could impose gender-based hierarchy uh, in the church and in the home. Yeah, and it fit right into, within the Asian context, the confusion, uh, Confucianism that we had for such a long time. So the patriarchy, so it just fit right in. And so, you know, a lot of, good things that missionaries did, but a lot of problems and we have to unpack and go backwards and redo a lot of this stuff. So thank you for sharing what happened in Africa. We know things like this happened around the world as white, uh, mostly male uh, missionaries went around the world. When you were talking about translation, so you know some languages like French is gendered. I had to learn French when I grew up in Canada. But the important thing is in your um, lectionary, you have the text, and then you have the uh, the proclamation, and then pre preaching prompts, which are so important. That preaching prompt needs to be translated into the various languages because you are bringing us new ideas, new thoughts, and this is for every um, part. You know, every section. Yeah, you, you follow these. Um, these uh, things, and then you end with the preaching prompt. It is so important because you're giving a lens, and you're showing us new ways of how we can preach from this. And it's so life-giving. We need so many more women's voices. And I'm just so grateful. You know, I encountered your work many years ago with the People's Bible. Is that the correct term? Because I can't remember my own book titles, but the yeah. one that you co-did with um, Curtis Paul DeYoung and Frank Yamada and so on. And I really, really appreciated it. So, you know, that you did co, but I can't believe you did this all by yourself. And this is just so wonderful. You're expanding our minds and our imagination about God, because I think sometimes, you know, we as Christians forget that we are these finite beings and God is infinite. And we have this narrow, 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 narrow view of who God is and God's presence in our world. And forget it's this infinite, God is infinite and we can't imagine the fullness of God. So you bring all these preaching prompts and new ways of thinking about these scriptures. So I am so grateful. Like, I don't know how you wrote it so quickly because you apply for the grant 2000. Um, 17 and you wrote it 2018 or is it the one year after you still oh, wrote I, it we, very quickly we got the notification in I applied in 17 but you don't get the notification until spring until of 18. 18. Uh -huh. and so I can tell you that I started just about on December 15th because that second Monday in December is when all of our grades are due and so okay. once my grades are in I was on sabbatical so there was no no other work in the semester. So while my sabbatical may not have started until January 1, you know, December 15, December 16, I started. I started in conversation and community. Um, I have uh, one particular writing group that's a closed group on Facebook. We'll see if that continues to stay open. Uh, where I ask people, what, what gospel goes with this? What do you think goes with this? Or what do you think of these pairings? And as I began to do translation, uh, do, how do you, what word do you like for uh, this person uh, uh, pregnant with child? You know, so I ran down some options, got some feedback. And in the year of 19, 2019, when I was on sabbatical, uh, part of my des grant design was to go visit with uh, religious readers, uh, clergy, lay people, seminarians, priests, pastors in a variety of denominations, including uh, some international contexts. And uh, one particular focus group uh, that was LGBTQIA uh, hearers and readers. So I could really think about the non-binary language and, and how focusing on women, which is a binary choice, 
can yet still be inclusive to not cut out non-binary folk. So I, I had those dialogue partners. I had an early partner who uh, rendered some of the Psalms using Sophia and wisdom for God language. And I started with those Psalms, that partnership didn't work. So I went back and redid the Psalms, but there, there are a few lines that carry through because um, there's some things that once translated um, really don't go another way. Uh, but so I just spent, you know, countless hours. And again, we were isolated because of the pandemic uh, doing that, the translations for the first volume, uh, Year W, uh, which uh, goes through all four gospels. That's why it's a standalone volume. And then for year A, the Matthean volume of the three, three year cycle, Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke, and then John will be in some of all of the um, I had a head start because having done the festival material, so the Christmas readings are the same every year. So I could just copy Christmas in and I could copy the Great Vigil of Easter and I could copy in Easter week and Holy Week. So that gave me a huge leg up on that. So I wasn't starting on page one. Um, I was maybe starting on page 101. But um, you know, some of the translations were, were brutal, brutal, and there's more to come. Translating, certainly for the Holy Week cycle and Passion play, uh, not using the Gospel of John because uh, it is anti-Semitic in places in itself, and its use has been profoundly anti-Semitic. So making a different choice there, uh, being thoughtful about the language, the Jews, uh, I often render that Judeans, the Judeans, uh, because everybody was Jewish. And we don't need that level of rhetoric um, on Christian lips, given our history. So uh, that passion play, that whole story was, you know, it's probably 157 verses of Greek through which, you know, I cried and sweated. Uh, but on the other side, telling the stories, our great vigil of Easter is supposed to be about salvation stories. In fact, in the Episcopal liturgy, it says something like, uh, let us now tell the saving acts of our God. And then we read all of these passages of scripture starting with creation and then the Exodus miracle. And so what I did was I took the creation lesson and I extended it to the creation of woman and man, right? Uh, keeping women in the story. For the, the Exodus at the sea, I extended it so that Miriam and the women were part of the reading. And then I chose narratives uh, that were completely different. So no Joshua, uh, none of those guys, no Samson, none of those guys. God saves Israel through Deborah. So I used Deborah. I used Judith. I used uh, the young enslaved woman, uh, Yehoshua, who saves uh, what is then the last king of Judah in his infancy from Queen Athalia. So it serves the ancient liturgical purpose, which is to tell stories of God saving acts but we don't need to uh, put men in center stage, even though there's plenty of those stories, we can tell a different set of stories. And so that's what I did with the Great Vigil of Easter. That is just fabulous. And I'm so grateful. I think the world is indebted. Um, you know, I have to confess, I got a Louisville sabbatical grant. So I just finished my sabbatical, so I'm back to teaching. And I was not as productive as you were with your grant so I'm like feeling so guilt so much guilt as I'm reading this because you always begin with you know you're grateful for your a little sabbatical grant and here I am I'm not even halfway through my project so I'm just like you have done so much during this um so during the sabbatical to do this because it is enormous task that you did so I, I I wanted to say to the listeners that each section each section has a passage proclamation text notes preaching prompts and you know i think it is such a lovely layout it is so life-giving and how you focus on the woman and i think as children we are taught by you know a lot of women sunday school teachers but they were taught by men so we don't even know some of these stories like you yeah. just mentioned a list of women 
I don't know half of those women. So mm -hmm. I think we really need to educate our young kids of these stories that have been missing, that have just been pushed aside and marginalized. And you did such a great job. So I just feel like even young children should be just reading this for themselves to get to the stories of women and, and get to the, the gender expansive language and the different languages about God that is just missing in the traditional lectionaries. So I'm just grateful for you. And I'm like, I don't know how you accomplished this and you're doing two more. So even um, in, in uh, I forget which volume in Advent you um, did Jesus and Hagar. And, mm -hmm. you know, you were able to bring in these stories and connect it together. And you did it so beautifully. Did you want to share more about this? Um, you did it for the Advent one. I series. think I can talk about that one. I will also say something about how it's being used. Uh, it is important for me as a woman and uh, many of my women readers, but I'm delighted to find it's important for my male readers. And I have yes. so many uh, pastors and priests who are signed up to begin preaching from year W this Advent and then the following year for year A. Um, and by then we should have year B. Um, for those who are interested in production schedule, I'm writing the second volume for Woman is Midrash right now. When I finish that, then I'll go to B and B and C. But we also have, I have uh, bishops, one bishop uh, who bought copies for all of his priests who were in charge of congregations. I have um, other bishops. I've been really thrilled at, at bishops who, and pastors who bought them for their whole staff. And so I'm seeing a lot of ad adoption by men. and. Uh, just over the weekend, a woman was ordained and they used the readings and they used yes. uh, the psalm and they put the psalm to music uh, yeah. because we're from a, in the Episcopal church, we chant our psalms. And uh -huh. I have had and my, she's a former uh, student of mine at Erland School of Religion. So she's yes. thrilled. She can't wait till, you know, she gets to hear this whole podcast. But yes. that's amazing that things like that are happening and it needs yes. to happen. Yes. So thrilled with uh, particularly uh, dios diocesan adoption and with male pastors and priests and rectors adopting it. Uh, now, uh, you asked me a question and I lost it in there. Oh, about um, Advent. So, yeah. so mm -hmm. we can use Hagar. that Advent as an example. Uh, that choice, so I had decided to use the four enunciation stories. And so Hagar is the first one. And the... Uh, thinking about uh, Advent, that line from the epistle where Jesus uh, thought it not, not robbery to take on human form, even the form uh, of, this, of a slave. Uh, and then you, but most people go past that to the next part, but I paused there and I said, huh, this is a new way of thinking about the incarnation, not ju just that Jesus took on human flesh, with all of our limitations and frailties, all of our bumps and bruises. But he took on uh, even the form of a slave is what it says. Um, and so what, the, what, does it, what did it mean to be a slave in his world? What is it that our cultural heritage tells us about enslavement? So I used Hagar and the story of her being impregnated by Abraham, uh, that is not to be understood as a consensual impregnation. She was uh, held in enslavement. Uh, she didn't have the right to consent. She didn't have the right to not consent. And so that theology of Philippians is saying, Jesus chose the kind of human body that anybody could do anything to, sell, abuse, batter, sexually violate. So Jesus did not come uh, as the king of Israel, even though those titles will be given to him, he also said, that's not how I'm doing it, right? Um, so using Hagar's enslavement as, as a visual for the profound abasement that Jesus self-inflicted in becoming incarnate uh, is, is another way to tell the the incarnation story for Advent. So I begin there. Um, in other places, I found myself asking how might the characters in the first lesson 
have prayed about whatever's going on. You know, there's always some kind of drama. And I found myself using the Psalms to give them voice. Um, so one of my favorite pairings is after the story of Tamar's rape by her brother Amnon, I add Psalm 27 and I imagine her praying it because there's a line that says, if my mother and father forsake me, God will take me up. And if you know that story, you know that after the attack, when it became public, David didn't say anything because Amnon was his firstborn and he loved him. And we get that exact, those exact words from a Dead Sea Scroll. Um, and so you'll find it in your NRSV Bible, but maybe not in some other Bibles. So she's in this situation where her father is saying nothing about her rape because he loves her brother who violated her. Um, and so I just imagine her praying this Psalm that says things like, when my enemies come upon me and eat up my flesh, what, what an interesting prayer to pray after a sexual violation. Um, and, she, and that Psalm includes, you know, longing to live in, in God's temple. Well, it's a place of safety and refuge. So that Psalm sounds completely different to me now that I've paired it and imagined Tamar praying that after her violation. Wow, oh, thank you for enlightening um, us and all the listeners. You know, I you know in some when you're doing the translations, I know you use you avoid certain languages. You say you don't use the word kingdom. So yeah. can you expand on that and why you don't and how it's helpful for all of us? Yes, I'm not reifying uh, male hegemony and hierarchy. And so when we're talking about who God is, what God is, and where God is, all of our human language is limited. We already know we're starting from inadequacy to describe the divine. A kingdom is a, a political and economic system. And it's a system of governance. And that's not what God is. When God uh, welcomes us to uh, the space and place in time that the Greeks used the word that is translated as kingdom, God is really not inviting us to a feudal governance system. God is inviting us to, to their reality, to their community and communion, to their presence, you know, to their love, to share in their reflected glory, right? So I use language that reflects that. So sometimes I use majesty, um, yeah. that we will be inheritors of God's majesty because it's really about the splendor and the glory, not about kingdoms fighting tooth and nail for a footprint. Um, so sometimes I use reign and realm. Sometimes I use dominion, but I'm not using masculine language for God and I'm not um, reifying uh, kingdom language or empire language. So I also don't use servant we know that neither Greek or Hebrew has discrete words that distinguish between enslavement and servitude. We also know that people didn't own their bodies, didn't own their rep reproductive cycle. And if they had children and were freed, uh, they could not take the children with them. That's not servitude, that's not a job, that's enslavement. Now it makes some of the passages hard to read, but we need to be more familiar with how pervasive uh, and how normative slavery was, even on the lips of Jesus, which explains why the Western world adopted it with a vengeance. So I don't whitewash the scriptures. I don't use the Lord because that's not God's name. Lord is a substitution because one cannot say God's proper Hebrew name, the letters Y-H-W-H, yud heh vav -Hey, um, how they are pronounced, we don't know. There are some scholarly guesses that are bad. They're also, um, disrespectful to Judaism, and it's an anti-Semitic practice to try to articulate a name that's held so sacredly uh, by Jewish folk. So I don't use Lord, I don't use King. Um, and so I do have a section in the foreword where I talk about the translation in broad strokes and let the reader know what they will experience and why. Um, I started that in Womanist Midrash, there is a translator's appendix where I explain why I translate and how I translate, how gender is implicated in the Hebrew language and in English. 
And so this is one of the things that differentiates me from other translators. And it's what all theologians of liberation know is that we identify our context. We don't say, this is what the text means. We say, I am doing this work as a womanist who is committed to Black Lives Matter. And I am translating this this way for this reason. I'm not saying this is the only way to translate it or that this is the only right way. But in this project, which is making women more visible and using a variety of language for God and humanity, I'm using this approach. Well, thank you. Your introduction is very clear how you are approaching. So I'm just thrilled and excited. And I know uh, I I can pick your brain all day long, but I know you're so busy. You're writing your women's, your second volume, uh, The Midrash. And uh, I wanted the listeners to know, when is the year B and C coming out for this, the Women's Lectionary for the whole church? We're looking at 2023. Both so of them will be coming we, out at the same time? Uh, it, de it depends on how they fall. Okay. It's, hard, it's hard to say. Uh, okay. I expect B will come first, but will it come six months for earlier? So, it's, it, so I'm just gonna say wow. 2023. Uh, That's two years from now. Yeah, that's yeah. not that far away. You've no, got a nice. very busy schedule, and I know you're on. So you're invited to speak so many places, and also on podcasts. And you do, uh, you preach so much. So I don't know how you keep up with all your busy schedule, but I think the whole world is indebted to your scholarship, oh, your yeah. your imagination, and it just so beautifully written it's like so poetic for me I just can sit there all day and just read it just um, as a devotional because I'm not preaching as much as I did um, before the pandemic so I really really am so grateful for all your scholarship not just for the women's lectionary for the whole church but all your other previous work it is amazing what you have accomplished. And I, I know after you're done that second volume, uh, the Midrash, and when you're done with this, I know you're gonna come up with even more fabulous work. And I can't wait for all the exciting work that you will continue to produce. And please tell your publisher to start translating this. I think it should first be translated into Korean because we are so patriarchal and we have so many Christians in Korea. So I, I really it's paradigm shifting and i really i really believe if we are going to treat women equally and move away from the sexual abuse and you know you tackle it here with the uh, you know with the rape victims of hagar and all these you know if we want uh to cherish women and women's bodies and not come under assault and abuse really how we read scripture, how we hear the sermon on, on a Sunday morning really affects how we are treated. So I'm just so grateful. And I really think you should have it in Korean first, just well, I'm to see my community. Conversations. I'm looking forward to conversations about what that would look like. What's the gender structure of languages, of, yeah. of target languages? and how would we preserve its character? And I'm completely open to those conversations. Yeah, so I hope, um, I know you got a lot on your plate, but hope eventually that the publisher will seek out translators. Um, Korean is, is a harder language, I think, um, but it's not a gendered language. So, uh, but I really, I, you know, you give me so much hope from these two, um, year A and year W, and I can't wait for the other two, because it really provides me hope for the future of the church. And I'm sure many of the other users and readers um, of your books and this lectionary will feel the same way. So I'm just so indebted to you. Thank you so much. I know you're so busy, but thank you so much for coming on Madame podcast and sharing your words of wisdom. Thank you. Right. Do you have any last uh, words that you want to share either for the readers of how they should use this? And um, please share your last words of wisdom with us. So my, my final words would be to uh, that this is organized around the Christian calendar, which begins with Advent, the season before Christmas. And Advent is the four weeks before Christmas. So really the Sunday after Thanksgiving is usually the first week of Advent. So that would be the week to start reading. Uh, 
uh, along. And for those reading it devotionally, because there are four lessons in each week, I would say read uh, one lesson uh, over the period of two days, read it a couple of times, or uh, read all four lessons together uh, repeatedly. But you have the four lessons, you have a kind of technical commentary about translating things that you might find interesting. And then you have the preaching prompts, which is a guide for preaching and for devotional thinking. So that is six blocks of text that you can spread out over the week or that you can read uh, re repeatedly, but get ready to start year W this Advent, which will line us up to be right on time with year A next year. And on my blog, willgaffney.com, coming in November, I will have a special page for those who are going to preach and those who are going to study devotionally these lectionaries. So people oh. will be putting up their sermon ideas. Uh, I'll give them a little starter, uh, but mostly it'll be people uh, back and forth. And you may also find other resources that are useful. willgaffney.com, W-I-L-G-A-F-N-E-Y. Okay, and how can we find you on Twitter? And Facebook? Will Gaffney. Okay, uh, so everyone, just Will, Google Will Gaffney. Gaffney. Will yep, Gaffney. She's all over the... <laughs> yes. Yep, you are all over the web anyway, so it's going to be very easy to find you. So please look at her website. And because you want us to start with the Advent, and Advent is just around the corner, I think everyone should go out and get their copies. Buy it for your own preachers, your ministers. Buy it for your family and friends and seminary students. I think it's a must-have book for all seminary students. So thank you so much for writing this during your sabbatical. It's an enormous amount of work that I can't even fathom how you finished it so thank you so much for writing it for the world and thank you so much for being my guest on Madang and I hope you'll be back again soon do you try to be a Christian but find church really difficult do you try to live faithfully but wrestle with embracing risk do you find yourself thinking a lot about who you are becoming if so then you need to read some Kierkegaard with us when we risk getting lost, maybe we can then find faith. To learn more and join over 1,000 others in the group, head to iheartkirkegaard.com. The Buddhist Tzu Chi Foundation is a volunteer-based global organization with missions in charity, medicine, education, and humanist culture. The foundation provides community and social services, national and international disaster relief, medical and charitable assistance, education, environmental protection, and a bone marrow donor registry promoting humanistic values and community volunteerism. Su Chi is currently sending emergency aid to eight Asian countries, India, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, Cambodia, Sri Lanka, Laos, and Taiwan, providing communities with life-saving medical equipment and supplies to help them overcome the COVID-19 pandemic. To find out more and to donate, please visit our website at www.suchi.us slash coronavirus. Invisible, published by Fortress Press, is available for pre-order wherever books are sold. Show your support and pre-order your copy today. For sponsorship inquiries, please email madangpodcast.gmail.com.